My name is Emily Roach and I'm a third year PhD candidate at the University of York. My research focuses on contemporary American poetry, media, memoir and fiction, together with work on queer space and music subcultures in post 1960s Britain. I work at the intersections of queer identity and visibility and representation in popular culture and I've had chapters published in a number of edited collections as you can see from this slide covering things like boy bands, Harry Potter and television series like Stranger Things, The Haunting of Hill House and Supernatural. In this video, I'm going to talk about the works of American poets who have been involved with spoken word poetry or slam competitions. For those that don't know the terminology, slam is a competitive form of performance poetry where poets have a three minute slot and are scored on a multiple, multiple factors such as adherence to time and audience response. Slam originated in Chicago in the 1980s and it draws on multiple influences such as the black arts movement of the 60s and the emergence of hip hop in the 1970s. The beat poets who are a pivotal part of San Francisco's post-war -war cultural framework in the late 1940s and 1950s are often cited as precursors to the contemporary spoken word poetry movement. However, much like Slam, the Beat Generation also had black cultural influences, their sounds inspired by the beat of 1940s jazz. They adopted and appropriated the influences of music and verse that were particularly prevalent during the Harlem Renaissance that broadly spanned the years after the end of the First World War into the mid 30s. In the 1980s, black poets documenting their experiences of HIV AIDS, such as Essex Hemphill and Wayson Jones pictured here, also frequently used spoken word. And you can find a clip of their performance of a poem called Brass Rail on YouTube, which was included in a film about the Harlem Renaissance looking for Langston. The HIV AIDS crisis was a notable period for black cultural production, particularly poetry, and some researchers such as Martin Duberman have referred to the period as the second Harlem Renaissance. My brief overview of these movements is very simplistic and they are not as interconnected as I've made them seem, but the point that is important to take away from this introduction is how black music and poetry has been so influential on spoken word poetry as we know it today. As Javon Johnson notes in Killing Poetry, talking about the Harlem Renaissance, the black arts movement and hip hop, these stages play particular roles in shaping cultural imaginaries as they pertain to contemporary black performance poets. Their influence on spoken word in general is undisputed. By way of introduction to my thesis, my research explores spoken word poems by American transgender and gender non-conforming poets. Many of those poems are available on YouTube. I'm drawing on some of my research today to explore how the poets I will introduce you to speak to an America fraught with political tensions, a rolling back of minority group rights, deep racial divides and systemic oppressions. Many of these poets directly confront key political issues such as the right to bear arms, bathroom bills, access to affordable health care and so on. They also experience multiple oppressions due to their intersectional identities and the works of these contemporary poets can tell us much about the life as an LGBTQIA person in America with Donald Trump as president. To set the stage, I'm going to start with poetry that responded to an act of significant violence against LGBTQIA people that took place in the months before Trump's election. When the first responders entered the Pulse nightclub after the massacre in Orlando, they walked through the horrific scene of bodies and called out, if you are alive, raise your hand. I was sleeping in a hotel in the Midwest at the time, but I imagine in that exact moment, my hand twitched in my sleep, some unconscious part of me aware that I had a pulse, that I was alive. The next day I woke to the news that an assault rifle had fired 202 bullets through a gay bar on Latin night in one of the worst massacres in US history. A massacre of people who did not leave the dance floor when they heard gunshots because they thought they were just the beats of a song. Everyone around me spent that day grieving and every tear tasted like someone's damp sweat drying in the morgue. 
That was a clip from non-binary poet Andrea Gibson's Orlando about the shooting at Pulse nightclub in Orlando on the 12th of June 2016. The Pulse shooting is one of the deadliest mass shootings by a single gunman in US history and the deadliest incident of violence against LGBTQIA people. It occurred on Latin night and killed 49 people and left 53 injured. In 2020, on the fourth anniversary of the shooting, Donald Trump introduced legislative reform that would make it significantly harder for transgender people to access health care. People who work academically with LGBTQIA literature have explored the function of collective mourning. In the literature and poetry and art that responded to the shooting at Pulse, you get a sense of communal mourning at work. In Gibson's Orlando, they talk about the way their hand twitched during the night, the sense of a shared heartbeat, a shared pulse. Throughout the poem, they explore how the bodies of the victims became entwined with their own, the attack on members of the community, however far away, directly felt by others who belong to that community. The way literature responds to collective trauma is something that has been talked about in multiple different contexts and is captured, for example, in the function of communal grief in HIV AIDS literature. Monica B. Pearl's research on AIDS literature talks about the collective community formation that occurs in moments of grief and explains how literary responses become part of the psychological process of working through grief, how a narrative structure can enable the writer to find coherence in unfathomable moments of grief. Spoken word and slam is known for its pointed politicised approach, the method of deliber delivery operating in some cases as a call to action. In the case of poetry that responded to Pulse, it is clear how grief reverberates through queer communities, how an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. This sentiment is something Gibson channels with a sense of rage that documents both an individual personal response and a community in mourning. Gibson's poem is archived on YouTube and serves as a lasting memory of that moment in the victims lost. But this poem, together with others by Andrea Gibson, such as Angels of the Get Through and Your Life, provide a global online community with connection, offering solidarity to those confronting violence and loss today. Gibson's poem about Pulse is a particularly raw one as it was created so soon after the attack. By contrast, the clip from the poem I'm going to show you next was published a year after the shooting as part of the Ted Orlando speaker events. Although this poem represents a similar form of communal grief, the focus is different as the poets Lee McCoby and Otter Young Allen question what, what actions have been taken in the year that followed. The poem addresses performative allyship, the emptiness of bland statements like love is love without meaningful action, and explains how expressions of solidarity ring hollow without legislative change. This poem, A Love Letter to Pulse, demonstrates how spoken word poets use their platforms to respond to what the poets describe as America's queer phobia, the way rainbow walkways become little more than empty gesture when LGBTQIA people remain at risk of violence in Donald Trump's America. Orlando will never be over. It will always be a reminder that where we call home does not keep us safe and that support does not end with a rainbow pin and a Facebook filter. Safety for us means cis and straight people sacrificing comfort. means white queer people recognizing our privilege. means less wearing of allyship and more acting on it. means we remember that pride began as a protest for all queer and trans people to be treated better. For all black and brown people people to exist in peace and, and to recognize, recognize that 49 names will never, never again be spoken into living and that is our responsibility to shoulder to do better for next time and, and next time is always right, right now. now and so when you come for us to you will look us in the eyes to, to recognize, recognize our humanity, humanity and to know that there are others just like us waiting for their turn to turn a club into a queer statement to color the world our shade of brave and to dance forever and exist loudly even after the music ends. 
There is a link to watching that poem in its entirety with this video, and you will notice how little things progressed between the massacre at Pulse nightclub and the year that followed. In actual fact, the election of Donald Trump that took place in November of that year increased the threat to LGBTQIA people. This threat is compounded for LGBTQIA Black, Indigenous and other people of colour, for immigrants and for others who have been endangered by the backlash against progressive reform that formed part of Trump's deeply divisive campaign manifesto. Lee McCoby published a poem called The Not Yet Burning Country on the day of Trump's inauguration. The poem begins, I have seen a burning country before. And McCoby has commented on the way it captures their experiences of xenophobia, homophobia and transphobia in South Africa and their perception of America as a transgender immigrant. The poem contains the line, America, you are not yet burning, but there is plenty of smoke. And people arguing whether it is fair to say this smoke kills or debating whether those who are already choking are being dramatic or truthful. And the media laughs about the matchstick of a leader who sparked the flames and tells the people, give the fire a chance. Nearly four years since the election of Donald Trump in 2016, McCoby's words seem grimly prophetic in an America deeply divided by racial inequalities, where the alt-right has gained renewed confidence as white supremacists emerged from online spaces like 4chan back into the public eye. Trump has mobilized supporters through incendiary political rhetoric and catchy sound bites, rejuvenating and rebranding the Make America Great Again slogan, first espoused by Ronald Reagan's administration. In The New Yorker, poet, novelist and essayist Ben Lerner equated Trump speak to a radically rough and wrong kind of poetry, his mangling of syntax turning political rallies into nightmarish versions of poetry readings. This reading that conflates Trump's populist rhetoric as a form of apocalyptic poetry with a typically left-leaning, politically charged spoken word scene sits uneasily with the images of America today, where gun-toting, Confederate flag-flying right exercise their rights to civil disobedience with little consequence, whilst the Black Lives Matter protesters exercising the same rights are met with tear gas, violence and moral outrage. Trump's mode of dialogue, despite Lerner's analogy, is of course not spoken word poetry. Politicians occupy a different stage to spoken word poets, and it would do a great disservice to the communities and poets that built those spaces to suggest that their cues came from a system many speak out against. Nevertheless, spoken word has a politicised and rallying effect, and it operates in counter to the alt-right dog whistles that have formed part of Trump's campaign strategy and recent responses to the traction gained by the Black Lives Matter movement. Non-binary poet Dennis Smith's Dear White America speaks to the racism that runs through the fabric of America. Smith is one of the best known examples of a transgender American performance poet who has been successful in both digital and print space with poems that confront their experience as a non-binary, black, HIV positive writer living in 21st century America. Any suggestion that racism in America may have been quelled by the election of America's first president, Barack Obama, have long since been disproven. And as recent events have shown in 2020, the notion of a post-race society is a fallacy. In a book called Identity Politics in the Uni United States, Kalila Brown Dean explains that the idea of a post-racial phase where issues of racism are no longer defining features of society is a myth. And in actual fact, the racially polarized environment in the United States was amplified during the 2016 election and its aftermath. Many researchers have pointed to the fact that the far right simply went underground and organized in online spaces and emerged when Trump's political rhetoric gave them tacit permission to do so. The racism that Smith explores in their work, specifically anti-blackness, is also something that goes beyond the alt-right. It is embedded in the entire American system from socioeconomic status, access to healthcare, the legacy of redlining and racial segregation in residential areas, to state sanctioned violence and the disproportionate rates at which black people are imprisoned. In their poem, Dear White America, Smith addresses the deep racism that exists in America and contextualizes the trauma and violence experienced by the black community. 
Other poets, such as Andrea Gibson and Daniel, have, like Smith's Dear White America, addressed poetry to white people in America. In Gibson's case, the poem All White Queers, and in Daniel's case, in a poem titled The Rainbow Responds to All White Queers Who Voted for Trump. Through the medium of spoken word, these poets respond not only to Trump himself, but to the voters whose actions at the ballot box place black and queer people at particular risk. Listening to Smith's poetry today and reading from Smith's collections, such as Don't Call Us Dead, and the newest collection, Homie, released this year, shows how little has changed since Smith first delivered Dear White America in 2014. Now, six years later, the poem is as relevant as ever. Cause you put an asterisk next to my sister's gorgeous face Call her pretty for a black girl Cause black girls go missing without a whisper of where Cause there are no amber alerts for amber skinned girls Because Jordan boomed and Emmett whistled And Huey P spoke it and Martin preached it Because black boys have always been too loud to live Cause it's taken my father's time My mother's time My uncle's time Time, my aunt's time, my grandma's time, my grandpa's time, my niece's time, my nephew's time. How much time do you want for this progress? I've left Earth and I won't stop until I find a place where my kin can be safe. Until black people ain't but people, the same color as the good wet earth. Until that means something. Until then, I bid you well. I bid you war. I bid you our lives to gamble with no more. I've left earth. Vietnamese American poet Chrysanthemum Tran made history by becoming the first trans feminine finalist of the Women of the World Poetry Slam. As part of the Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies program at the University of Chicago, Tran was invited to speak in early 2016 at the Pan-Asian Solidarity Coalition Spring Festival on Queering the Present. During the interview, Tran indicates how, for the transgender performance poet, working with the strict time limit of slam poetry can feel like a matter of life or death. She said, I have three minutes to convince someone that my life has importance, even if they don't see me as human. I need to figure out how in three minutes I can get someone to humanize me. I'm trying to convince strangers that my life matters. This sense of urgency and time running out is reflected in all of Chrysanthemum Tran's poetry. Tran uses the short time frame of slam poems to explore the brutal history of colonialism, intersections between queerness and race, unspoken transgender histories, her own closeted childhood, sexual violence and violence within the family home, and a desire to hold America to account for making the so-called trans panic defense available to people who commit violence against transgender people, something explored in her poem Discovery. America, You've got Jennifer's blood on your hands, got the blood of so many sisters on your hands, and I will never let you forget. Through her poetry, Tran gives spaces to unheard voices, both by exploring her own experiences with transphobic violence and sexual assault, and by urging the audience to remember transgender women who have lost their lives, the constellations that represent for Tran clusters of women who have lived before me. This emphasis on amplifying voices of those marginalized by gender and race is a particular concern of trans and through her platform and poetry, she uplifts voices that have been silenced by historical accounts, demonstrating how gender non-conforming and transgender people have existed throughout the centuries. Academic Jacqueline Pryor has written about the transgender hole in history, a critical gap described as a slip from history, whereby historical accounts of queer history have erased or forgotten those stories of particularly marginalized groups, such as transgender women of color. Pryor says, the marginalized lives of queer and trans folks slip from history because there are few institutions devoted to collecting, protecting and committing their history to collective memory. Through trans poetry, she uses spoken word not only to explore the experiences and marginalization of transgender people in America today, but also to ensure that her audience is aware of their place in the past.
Everything I learned about hating myself, I learned in classrooms. The first time I learned my people's history was a bilingual Catholic Bible study. There I learned from 1874 to 1954, the French colonized Vietnam. They called it a mission from God, called it modernizing a backward society. My people called it rice fields burning down, white folks moving in, taking what is not theirs. Despite our words, history was never written in our favor. Now, French cognates stain the Vietnamese language. For example, the Vietnamese café is derived from the French le café, as in brown bodies bent over colonial cash crop, while our nimble fingers pick and pick away. Or cine, derived from le cinéma, as in armed with cameras, they captured the jungles of these darker colonies, Haiti, Senegal, Cambodia, Vietnam, all our faces like wild animals. I'm going to finish this video paper with another of my favourite poets, Cameron Awkward Rich. Since its beginnings on the college slam circuit, Cameron Awkward Rich has amassed a notable collection of published works. His poetry and non-fiction prose has appeared in literary journals such as Hobart, The Seattle Review and The Rumpus, and his spoken word poetry can be found on YouTube channels like Button Poetry. In 2015, Button Poetry and Exploding Pinecone Press published his chapbook, Transit. His first full poetry collection, Sympathetic Little Monster, was published by Ricochet Editions in 2016, and his second collection of poetry, Dispatch, was published at the end of 2019. I'm going to read you one of my favourite poems from Transit, but before I do, it's useful to set that collection in context. In an interview with Lambda Literary in 2016, Awkward Rich said that the collection was born out of a desire to rewrite the travel narrative as transition narrative, resisting the suggestion that, in his words, there is a fixed point that gender is a knowable destination. This refusal to sus subscribe to the linearity of mainstream transgender stories is noticeable in the structure of the collection, which urges the reader to move back and forth within both the individual poems and the collection as a whole, demonstrating a resistance to chronological storytelling. Like the other poems, poets I've mentioned, such as Dennis Smith, Lee McCoby, and Chrysanthemum Tran, Cameron Awkward Rich's poet poetry shares the same focus on exploring how queerness, and in all these cases, specifically transgender experience, intersects with race, racism, colonialization, and anti-blackness. The poem I've chosen to read is called The Invisible Girl, 1996. This summer, all the coins beneath the couch go missing, shoved into her spotless palms. Her father doesn't see her lift bus tokens from his wallet, doesn't see them float into her room like copper flies. No one ever looks for her when things disappear. After all, she's a little girl and hardly there. The sun shines through her chest as she rides to the train across her town, glitter bike piloting itself, streamers cutting the air behind her, and who in that white picket place would have stopped her leaving? She makes it all the way unseen, then drifts back to her parents' doorway, such a lucky little girl to be so unharmed, even they don't notice she had gone. To conclude, I feel it's necessary to explain that it's of course possible to find queer joy within the broader works of these poets, and it's vital to recognise that joy is a site of queer resistance and one that occupies many of these poets' work. LGBTQIA literature has a long association with depictions of the so-called tragic queer, and I don't want to perpetuate the notion that queer literature has that preoccupation with tragedy through the areas I've focused on in this video paper, which particularly address grief, trauma and oppression. However, due to limited time and in the current climate of the upcoming American election, a global pandemic that has disproportionately impacted people of colour and a revitalised civil rights movement born out of the continued state sanctioned violence against black people and the broader risks to tran black transgender people in America, I hope the areas I have focused on offer some insight into the way these poets have produced works which offer a deep insight into life as an LGBTQIA person in America and I also hope I've given you enough of a taster that you will be encouraged to look into the broader works by these poets in more detail in your own time. Thank you so much for listening to this paper. <laughs>